Hello and welcome to week 12 of Jazz Pop and Rock. We only have a few more weeks until the end of the semester. I am so excited to see what you all do for the World Music Project and to talk about our topic for this week, hip hop. We are going to start from the very beginning of the genre with the first hip hop party and go through the 90s with discussion about the fatal beef between Tupac Shakur and Notorious B.I.G. I got a lot of information for this presentation from the amazing documentary series Hip Hop Evolution on Netflix. Next week, we will speak about some modern artists who are making big splashes in current hip hop. As a content warning for our playlist, there are several songs with the N-word in them and some misogynistic and homophobic language. While I do not condone any use of this language, I also believe wholeheartedly that it is not my place as an educator to censor the artists. This was the language either of the times with more commonplace misogyny and homophobia used by society or the vernacular language of those saying the N-word. Alright, without any further ado, let's jump back to the 70s with the first hip-hop party in the holy trinity of hip-hop. The day is August 11th, 1973, and DJ Coolheart is planning a birthday party for his sister. This is considered the birth of hip-hop because of the records that her was playing. He played all disco and funk records, and even more importantly than that, he only played and extended the breaks or breakdown sections of the songs. Africa Bambata went to a Cool Hurt party and brought that sound to the South Bronx. Africa Bambata is responsible for coining the term hip-hop. He was also an Africanist and wanted to reconnect black people with their ancestors and with Africa that were living in the United States. The third member of the Holy Trinity of Hip Hop was Grandmaster Flash. Flash sought to refine hip hop. However, he didn't have enough money for equipment and was forced to salvage equipment from backyards. He got speakers from abandoned cars, for instance. Grandmaster Flash was critical of DJ Cool Herc's style, calling it disarray in unison. Flash was inspired by the clarity of radio remixes and wanted to bring that to the new hip-hop sound. Jumping forward to 1979, this began what was known as the hip-hop on wax era, where a big push started for records to be made. Sylvia Robinson, a talent scout from All Platinum Records, was looking for a new act when she saw Love Bug Starsky perform. The record company was failing until Sylvia started signing rappers from New Jersey. She is responsible for creating. She is responsible for creating the Sugar Hill Gang, who recorded the massively popular song Rappers Delight. The Sugar Hill Gang was composed of Big Bang Hank, Master G, and Wonder Mike. Rapper's Delight was the first worldwide hip-hop hit. It was not without controversy, however, as Big Bang Hank stole several rhymes from parties in his verse, but was the first one to record them. As a result of the success of Rapper's Delight, hip-hop exploded. People immediately started oversaturating the airwaves, with hip-hop. Even comedians such as Rodney Dangerfield made hip-hop songs. As the market became more commercialized and started to get away from the spirit of hip-hop, Africa Bambata moved rap to Manhattan as an attempt to insulate the art form from the nonsense being recorded and to keep it in its purest form. As we look to the 80s, New York was still the dominant force in hip-hop. Russell Simmons approached Rick Rubin from the Beastie Boys, and together they co-founded Def Jam Records. Rick Rubin was also the same producer last week that worked with Johnny Cash with his album, American Recordings. Rubin headed up music production, whereas Russell Simmons headed marketing and the business side of Def Jam Records. Toward the end of the 80s, Public Enemy was formed by Chuck D and Flavor Flav. They exemplified a new black consciousness. This was symbolized in their songs Fight the Power and Public Enemy No. 1. The latter song caught the attention of Rick Rubin, but Chuck D denied his offer. He didn't want to sell out and wanted to make music that meant something. All of this so far that we have discussed was happening in 
New York, but this was not the only home for hip hop. In Los Angeles, parties at roller rinks were the rage at the beginning of hip hop. The musical genre techno was king at these roller parties. The first hip hop group in LA was the world class Reckon Crew, made up of Dr. Dre, DJ Yella, and Lonzo. They saw music as a way to seduce women and made it very clear that they were trying to sell sex through music. The first solo artist on the West Coast was Ice T. He began by making Crip rhymes, or rhymes affiliated with the Crip gang. To Ice T, music was secondary to the gang scene. Crip rhymes spoke about the hardships faced by those growing up in the ghettos of Los Angeles. The evolution of LA's rap styles goes as follows. Crip rhymes, which became reality rap, which became gangster rap. Similarly, the world-class Wrecking Crew developed into one of the hardest gangster rap groups of all time. NWA was made up of Dr. Dre and DJ Yellow from Wrecking Crew, and they added Easy e Ice Cube, and MC Ren. The group was produced by Arabian Prince, and they sought to make a record about life in South Central LA. Easy e knew Dre from their days in gangs. Easy e also knew Ren, and Ice Cube actually lived down the street from Dr. Dre. The album the group produced together was straight out of comedy. Going north along the coast and stopping in Oakland, California, we find ourselves in a politically motivated area that was dominated by funk music and pimp culture in the early 90s. Pimp culture was characterized by the movie The Mac in 1973. Funk music gave rise to lockstep dancers who were inspired by the Black Resurgence, the official dance group of the Black Panther Party. Closely affiliated with the Black Panthers was a young activist and musician, Tupac Shakur. Shakur's mother was Afeni Shakur, a member of the Panther 21 in New York. Tupac partnered with Layla Steinberg to become an activist, but it was Atron Gregory who promoted Tupac as a musician. It was with Digital Underground that he would get his start with a verse on the song, Same Song, before going on tour with them. If music didn't pan out, Tupac was ready to leave the African Panthers in Atlanta. He was a political rapper first and a performer second. One of his first solo hits was actually a women's anthem about teen pregnancy in the black community called Brenda's Gotta Be. This was shocking for a number of reasons, but most importantly, Tupac used his platform as a man to give voice to teen women and mothers. Jumping back to the other coast and continuing to set the stage for what would be one of the deadliest rivalries in music, the notorious B.I.G. got his start rapping freestyles in front of the Paul Robeson Theater. Biggie knew he wanted to be a rapper, and so he went to the producer, 50 Grand, and asked him to DJ for him. 50 Grand played Biggie's demo for Master G from the Sugar Hill Gang, and he immediately passed it on to as many people as would listen. Biggie was featured in the Source magazine as a result of his demo tape. He was soon after signed by P. Diddy at Bag Boy Records. It was Puff who made Biggie write hooks and who introduced R&B samples into hip-hop, making it more commercially accessible. This was New York's answer to the dominating L.A. street sound. Together, Biggie and Puff put out Biggie's hit album, Ready to Die. West Coast rappers were dominating the charts in the early 90s, but they really only wanted respect and recognition from the East Coast. The first spark to the rivalry between East and West was the song Fuck Compton by Tim Buck. Following this release, Tupac was beaten by the Oakland Police Department on a recording visit. It should be said that Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls were close at the start of this rivalry. In fact, they would regularly hang out, smoke, and rap together while the other was in town. This started to change following the Quad Studios shooting. The Quad Studios shooting took place on November 30th, 1994. Tupac had just headed to a studio near Quad Studios 
following a deliberation he was going through for a rape case. Tupac was present at the party, though did not commit any of the acts he was accused of. In all honesty, the police were concerned about his ability to rile people up with his activism and feared his political sway, so they jammed him up with his case. Tupac was going to the studio to record a freestyle. At the time, Biggie was at Bud Studios recording with the newly formed group Junior Mafia, and he told Tupac to come over. As he rounded the block, walking to the other studio, Tupac was robbed and shot five times. This attack sparked paranoia that Biggie had paid for the hit, and he was convinced that every rapper in Brooklyn knew about the shooting and chose not to stop it. This was, of course, not true. Soon after the Quad Studio shooting, the song Who Shot Ya was released by Notorious B.I.G. This was taken by Tupac and the rest of the West Coast as a direct diss to Pac. But truly, it was just poor timing. Following the release of Who Shot Ya, Tupac befriended Suge Knight while doing time for the bogus rape case. Suge Knight was the head of Death Row Records and was also a huge opponent to what he called studio gangsters. In Suge's eyes, you had to keep the criminal element close in order to rap about gang life. Things began reaching a fever pitch at the 1995 Source Awards. First, Suge Knight goes on stage and disses P. Diddy and Bad Boy while accepting an award. Snoop Dogg then takes the mic and says, East Coast ain't got no love for Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg, several times after receiving booze for his award win. While Tupac was in prison, Suge told him that if he wanted out, he had to sign with Death Row. Tupac's friend, Richie Rich, advised him against the move, but he ended up signing with Suge and Suge Knight posted his bail. During his incarceration, Tupac was just focusing on and writing about how he was wronged by Biggie and immediately went to record the album All Eyes On Me with the hateful anthem, Hit Em Up, as a single. The beef between Tupac and Biggie was partly driven by the media reporting on it. They took things out of context and only fanned the flames of paranoia in Tupac's mind. Things came to a head as Suge Knight and Tupac were shot in a drive-by on September 13, 1996. Tupac would die from his injuries. Following the Source Awards that year, Biggie was inspired to start his own record label, and with support from P. Diddy, he founded Junior Mafia Records and signed the immensely talented and raunchy rapper Lil' Kim almost immediately. The following spring, the Vibe Magazine Soul Train Awards took place. Biggie, Puff, and all of Junior Mafia were in attendance of the awards ceremony and the after party. As Biggie went to leave the after party, he was shot and killed as he got into his car. P. Diddy nearly quit music following Biggie's death. One day, he heard every breath you take by the police on TV while he was mourning. He took this as a sign that he had to keep going and released I'll Be Missing You with Faith Evans, who was Biggie's widow. Soon after the tragic events described above, Puff organized a team of super producers he called The Hitmen and went on a music writing frenzy. He rented out a compound in Trinidad and Tobago and was on a mission to record as many songs as possible. It's All About the Benjamins by Puff Daddy was vital in changing the atmosphere of the pop. It featured a slowed and reversed sample from Barry White. After Biggie's death, Puff's focus was on fun. Together with the hitmen, Puff started the Jiggy era in hip hop. What a riveting tale of how hip-hop was created and a tragic story of two friends turned enemies. If you can't tell from this, I absolutely love hip-hop and find the history of everything fascinating. Our listening exam materials for this week are Who Shot You by Notorious B.I.G., Hit Em Up by Tupac, and I'll Be Missing You by Puff Daddy and Faith Evans. And that's everything for today's lesson. Get your assignments in, and I will be updating grades the following morning to cement zeros for the rest of the semester, so be sure to ask for an extension before the assignment is due if you need more time. Keep working on the World Music Project as well, and good luck. See you next week. Have a good one.